The changes in the education sector, the way we assess students, the rise of digitalization and artificial intelligence, the changes in the learning environment and many other unusual and controversial questions. We will be examining them one after the other in this channel. My name is Daniel Wisniewski and this is Education Chatter. Welcome to Education Chatter. Um, today, we're going to talk about a very hot topic about the results of PISA. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what PISA is, PISA is an international system of assessment of students that is so important that certain ministries are really dying to perform well there, and they want to show that their education systems are better than others. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Anna Pons from OECD. She's a policy analyst working on PISA and she will give us all the secrets of, of this performance uh, performance assessment. Anna, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, a pleasure to be here. And just to say that I'm working on uh, TAVIS and I interpret the PISA results, uh, but I'm not crafting the results. But uh, let's, see, uh, let's see how far we can go in, in making sense of all of this data. Very good, thanks a lot again for, for being with us. So Anna, um, first of all, what PISA is? What is this? What are? What is this uh, international students assessment uh, program? PISA is a, a test of students at age fifteen. So in many systems, or in some systems, this is really the last year in which the vast majority of students are in the education system. So it can of kind of give us an an indication of where students are at the end in some systems of, of their education process that tries to measure their knowledge and skills. And that's an important emphasis because one thing is I'm trying to understand what you know, and the other one is trying to understand not only what you know, but what is that you can do when exposed to novel situations. In, a, in 2022, uh, we had about 29 million uh, students represented in the PISA test. And these were represented because there were 700,000 students from 81 countries that took the test in a way, and they were selected in a way that were representative of this uh, 29 uh, million. And what we were trying to measure in particular in 2022 was their ability to think like mathematicians. So they were asked questions around how they would go about formulating, solving, applying, or evaluating uh, mathematical problems. All right, and is it, the, the question is, is PISA tests all the same? So the, because I, I assume that you're measuring several things. You're measuring well, science, you measure mathematics, you, you measure uh, reading, I think. Um, but do they do they differ in any way from, from, from cycle to cycle? So PISA is a really uh, collective uh, endeavor of all the 81 uh, governments that, that participate. And what they decided to focus on was on these subjects mathematics, reading, and science. And whilst the three subjects are measured in every cycle, in every cycle, there is one of these subjects in which we really go deeper and try to measure that uh, subject in, in a much greater level of, of detail so that we can better understand how students perform uh, in that particular uh, cycle. As you were saying in the very beginning, uh, PISA has grown big over the years. PISA has been around for about 20 years. And we've also realized of the limitations of just measuring uh, reading, science, and mathematics. So at the OECD, we not only have uh, the PISA survey, but we also have other surveys that I think are also very important and complementary to PISA, but perhaps are less known to the wider public. These are, for example, the TAVI survey, in which we ask uh, for uh, teachers and uh, school leaders about their perceptions uh, around, uh, around schooling issues. 
We also have a, a survey on social and emotional skills in which we try to measure those skills that the PISA survey is not capturing with the same level of, of detail. But the PISA survey itself has also evolved a lot. And for example, one of the forthcoming uh, volumes, it will be on, on creative thinking, which is something that perhaps one would think like uh, that PISA doesn't measure. Well, PISA does try to measure this as well, and we'll see these results in the coming in the coming months as well. Okay. Look, if I would be a government, let's say I'm a, I'm a Pole myself, I'm from Poland. Let's say I'm a Polish government. I would love my kids to perform well there, to say to the world, and I know that certain countries do. Um, I mean, there's certain countries in the world that kind of are proud of their education system, and they use it as a kind of a state marketing. Uh, we can, I mean, I can name at least uh, uh, Finland used to do that, or Singapore used does it as well. Like uh, education is our, you know, it's like our chocolate in Belgium. It's, it's like a, a selling point. So if I'm a government, I would like my kids to perform well in PISA. In fact, I know that there has been, because I'm a victim of one of the reforms, in fact, in Poland, when I was a child, one of the reasons why they changed the system of education there was because they wanted the kids to perform better in PISA. Uh, and uh, so if I'm a government, coming to the question eventually, uh, I would like them to perform well. So that question is, how do you choose from this 29 million students a survey that could be really representative? So you cannot really trick uh, PISA. Uh, PISA is just draws uh, representative samples of uh, students. I said that there are uh, 690, there are almost 700,000 students participating and they represent 29 million students. It will be unthinkable to ask every student from every of these 81 countries to actually take the test that will take too much time and it will be too costly. So what we, what the experts that define the PISA technical standards do is that they actually draw a random sample uh, of these 29 million students that will provide for representative results at the national level. That's why we can report results uh, for every of the countries uh, because we have these representative samples uh, from every country. And not only we can report results at the, at the national level, but also we try to draw as well samples that would be representing different groups. And that's why we report results on gender differences. We report results on disadvantaged students, on students with immigrant backgrounds, because we have drawn the samples in a way that randomly we have enough students representing these different groups for every country. But you cannot really trick PISA. And, uh, and what PISA measures is actually what the students know uh, no one are able to do. So, uh, And every country participates in the definition of all of these standards and monitors all of these standards. So it's not possible to cheat. I can see. Uh, question. OK, let's get to it. What's the best education system in the world? According to I, how could you measure that? I, I I would actually challenge back that question because there is not such thing as one best education system in the world, and there is not such thing as one best way of measuring education in the world. PRISA provides us a reference uh, according to what some countries, 81 countries, have defined as importance. And out of this reference, what we know is that there are some countries that consistently manage to achieve high levels of quality and equity in their systems. And these are, for example, uh, Singapore, uh, Canada, uh, New Zealand, these countries consistently over several cycles have managed to be uh, top performers, not just by having their students uh, respond best to all of these uh, questions included in, in, the, in the PISA test, but also making sure that the differences between the best students, those at the top and those at the bottom, are the minimum so that the profile or the background of, of students doesn't really matter that much and doesn't determine the education of success. So the way in which we define success in PISA, it's uh, it's multifaceted. It's not just being the best performer, but also uh, limiting these uh, gaps between uh, students. 
I know. Like it's it's actually quite interesting. I remember I visited Finland some time ago to to study their educational system, and one thing that they were really proud of is that regardless of where you're living, uh, of your location, you can be in Helsinki or you can be in the rural area in the you know polar cycle, uh, your educational attainment will be more or less the same. And they are very, very proud of that. So I think that this is a very good measurement to also take into account. So we also see this kind of social divide. Now, the question here is, um, okay, you said about international, um, anything about Europe? How did Europe do this year? So and it's interesting are, that... And again, which are, let's say, the countries in Europe that perform best in PISA? So what we see across the world is an alarming decline. Uh, the PISA results have fallen uh, 15 points. This is unprecedented. Um, we were already seeing a, a trend of stagnation across the PISA cycle since the year uh, 2000. Uh, but what we have seen this year, it's really a decrease of, of results at, at a level that it's really uh, unprecedented. Um, what I think it's uh, encouraging about all of these global results is that at least socioeconomic gaps have not widened. They, the socioeconomic differences between the students continue to explain about 15% uh, of the variation in results, but that's not, not the case in, in Europe. And here is where the alarming, I think, fact in, in Europe uh, uh, is, which is that uh, for the eight countries in which we see that the performance gaps have increased, seven of them are European. So mm -hmm. the socioeconomic gaps in Europe do have an uh, increase over since the last uh, cycle. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that this is one of the things that Europe has been most proud historically, right? The fact that uh, that there is greater levels of equity. And as you were saying in, in one of the best examples in Finland, the fact that the school that you send your kids to doesn't matter. But what we are seeing is that this situation is deteriorating. It's changing, yeah. And then, okay, now another question about about the uh, about the schools really. Um, one thing, you know, we when we talked about policy often here in this, in this channel, on this channel. Uh, and uh, well, PISA does tell us, okay, how do students perform? But uh, it's actually quite interesting that many countries that are totally different, they perform well in PISA, but hey, that their educational system are not nothing like like each, like each other. Right? Not not like they are not alike. So you have an example again, Estonia, which I think in Europe like is 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 has is becoming kind of a, a leader on on the PISA performance. Then you have Poland. Poland and Estonia has nothing in common, really. Um, then you have Finland. Then you could say, I don't know, the Netherlands, which is a totally different country. So um, is there any studies or any research that would kind of link the policy solutions and the performance? Uh, have, you, have you undertaken any studies of that? I think that what you're suggesting is extremely hard to, to measure. And of course, we've done some studies uh, at the macro uh, level, trying to see these correlations. Uh, but I, I think, or at least what I think that we should be reading in it are that I, I, I do think that there are some common patterns. And through all of these different cycles of PISA, we've continued to observe very similar things. What are these things? We are observing, for example, that it doesn't really matter how much you spend in education after a certain level. Mm. Uh, so, for example, Japan obtains way better results than the U.S., even if Japan spends 40% less than the U.S. We are also seeing in PISA, and it's over and over in every cycle, that it also doesn't matter how much time students spend in the classroom. And actually, the countries that obtain better results uh, do not have their students spend the most time in the classroom. So that relationship, it's also inverse. And, and I think that another important uh, factor that, that PISA shows is the importance of uh, teachers. Teachers are the determinant of, uh, of student outcomes in every system. Teachers are our most important resource. 
And what we see when we really look with a bit more detail and going beyond PISA is that actually teachers are what matters the most to the quality of any education system. And whilst the cultural context, whilst the policies in different countries that are performing at top levels might be, might be different, what they do have in common is an obsession to actually nurture and support their teachers. They may be doing, doing it in different ways, in ways that are more in line with their own cultures, but what they do have in common, it's a vision towards where they go, where they want their education system to go and how to support the key players in the system, which are teachers and school leaders. I must tell you, you have just opened a Pandora box with, with all those statements. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'm, I, I even wrote it down this because I think this is a this is a very interesting findings. You said money be 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 beyond certain level do not matter, which is a very striking point. Saying that, uh, well, maybe sometimes we don't have to consider spending more on education. Maybe we reach a certain level and we can get the same performance. That's a very strong statement. Then you said student time in the classroom, so we could maybe. Uh, lower the number of hours that kids are in the school and and to some extent uh, this could even have a potentially positive output in terms of their their uh, ex um, their um, performance and then you said teachers well if if you would be speaking to a teacher trade unionist i could tell you that they would say in every single country that teachers are not valued enough uh, and in, and particularly in countries, I mean, I don't know how is Estonia doing, but I know that in Poland, because I'm Polish myself, uh, there's a lot of complaint about how teachers are being paid, how they are being treated, and so on and so on. So you say uh, those countries that often perform well are those that value the teachers. Well, I'm not sure if Poland would be one of them, uh, although it's, again, the second best in Europe for, according to the recent results. Um, so, 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 so I'm going to challenge you on this. Uh, saying, well, yes, but maybe there are exceptions to that rule. I, I think that you are mentioning this uh, teacher recognition, which I, I think it's not just trade unionists that feel that this is important. We also do measure it in the TALIS survey. Mm -hmm. And actually what teachers tell us across the countries participating in the TALIS survey is that only one third of them feel mm -hmm. that their job is valued by yes. society. This is of course an alarming uh, finding, right? But what we are seeing is that there is a correlation between those countries where there is a greater number of teachers that do feel valued mm -hmm. and students' performance. We're talking about correlations and of course there might be exceptions. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know in particular what explains the case in Poland. Uh, but what I do can tell you is that teachers in Finland, in Singapore, in Shanghai, uh, they are uh, they feel recognized and they feel that their job is valued. But it's not only about the perception of recognition. It's actually having a coherent teacher policy that starts with teaching standards that provide guidance to universities on how to prepare teachers, uh, that teachers, when they come to schools, have support and have mentoring opportunities, that they have opportunities to collaborate with their peers and push and pull each other instead of being alone in their classrooms, that they have opportunities to be evaluated and, and to be given more challenging assignment. And for example, the country that performs at the top of PISA, Singapore, has one of the most impressive teacher management policies where they actually try to assess the potential of teachers and if they have potential to become and to take on leadership responsibilities in the system, they put them in a two-year track where they are exposed, they job shadow uh, the school principal so that they can see what it is like. And if they like it, uh, then they can apply to the job. And this means that the system can also see how would they do if they were principals, if they had more responsibilities and they can decide on whether or not to give you the, the job before actually uh, uh, b before actually applying to it. That if they are really good in the classroom, they give them opportunities to grow as mastery teacher and actually provide mentoring and support teachers that might be weaker. 
And if they are not doing so well into the system, they put them in, in, in opportunities to actually take on more administrative tasks. So what Singapore has, it's a really uh, strong policy to manage the talent of the most important resource in any education system, which is uh, teachers. And I think we could uh, speak similarly about the ways which are different in which Finland handles their, uh, their, 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 their professionals or in which Shanghai handles their professions, but they do have an obsession in nurturing them, in giving them opportunities to grow as professionals and to collaborate with others uh, so that there is this, uh, th there is this professional uh, growth along the career. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you mentioned that there is a general drop in the results, and you said that it's unprecedented. What would be the reasons behind it? Well, I think that part of the reasons are what anyone could have expected, which is that COVID has had an impact, right? But I think that we need to go beyond this simplistic reading and actually see that we were already, as I was mentioning at the beginning, in a trend of stagnation and for, and in, and for some countries, a clear ten, trend of decrease. No, So FINWA, for example, used to be one of the top performers, but in the last cycles, it has followed a downward uh, trend and it's the same for other countries. So I, I think that COVID can be one of an, one explanation, but I think that there is more that we need to read into it and that we need to try to collectively understand what explains this uh, decrease of the results. And this comes at a surprising time because what we see is that whilst human intelligence seems to be whether receding or stagnated, what we see is an explosion of artificial uh, intelligence. And we asked ChatGPT to respond to the PISA test. And ChatGPT got 90% of the responses in reading correctly. In the case of mathematics, at the time when this was done, it was only 45%. For now, given the last developments uh, in generative AI, it will probably be a better score. But what we see is an explosion of artificial intelligence at the time where our human intelligence might be stagnated according to this test, right? And at the same time, if we look as well in a long-term perspective, what we see as well is that we are, have put more money into the system and we are not seeing the results. We've actively invested, I think in real terms, more than 1% more in the last at least 10 years, whilst the results have decreased. So where is the value for money, right? And that's why I'm saying that it's not about putting money or about putting time. What really matters is making sure that our teachers are uh, that we support our teachers to really deliver the best education possible and, and improve teaching and learning in a continuous uh, way. What really matters is what teachers do in the classroom, not the amount of, of, of resources. And sometimes we get lost in these distractions. Okay, you say money, money is not the most important. And I couldn't agree more. It's more like how you use the money really and how you, what is your vision for education? But then, do you see any correlation between the socioeconomic background of students and their performance, first of all? And on a country level, is there any countries that we could consider, okay, a poor country that performs well in PISA? Uh, that's a, a, a very good uh, question. Certainly, there is, uh, there is has traditionally been, and not just PISA, but all the education research shows that this correlation between students' background and, uh, and, and, and results uh, in education. Students who have access at home to more books, to parents that are well-educated. First, their parents will certainly typically care more about the education, might support the students in their homework, might increase and set high expectations uh, for, for their students. One of the one of the, the, the things that are still surprising today is to see the gap between the aspirations of advantage students and disadvantage students. Advantage students, because of their parents' parental expectations, tend to aspire uh, to go to university in a greater number than mm. disadvantage students that maybe do not see beyond what they can see at, at home. And whilst this is not, uh, well, this doesn't tend to be so accentuated for those disadvantaged students that are good performers, that are beating the odds, these differences are, also, are very clear for those students that are just average, right? So 
there are still uh, important socioeconomic differences and there are countries that manage to achieve high levels of equity and, and, and quality at, at the same time. Um, but the socioeconomic differences are, are, are staggering. And in particular in Europe, as we were saying, um, there has been a deterioration or, or an increasing gap uh, socioeconomically. One particular point that I think have been very contentious in debates in Europe, it's the, the, the performance of uh, immigrants. And I think there is a lot of, uh, of, that there are a lot of nuances to be added to those debates because some countries and policymakers might be tempted to, oh, our results have deteriorated, but that's because we have uh, more immigrants. But what I think that it's very interesting to look and to further consider is what is behind that. So for example, we see a 29 point difference in the performance between immigrants and native born students across OECD countries. But when we eliminate, when we remove from that, the socioeconomic, uh, the socioeconomic differences that might be explaining this performance gap, this is just 15 points. So we are already half right, of the point. And if on top of that, we remove the differences in terms of the language that they speak at home, so if these immigrants speak the same language as the natives, the difference is just five points. Mm -hmm. But if we take more detailed studies, like what we did uh, with data from uh, PISA 2015, what we found is that there are some groups of immigrants, like for example, the Chinese students, that would actually outperform the native, the native, yeah, the native-born students, particularly when they are a second generation. So I think that uh, when we talk about socioeconomic differences, we should not think that poverty is destiny. Uh, there are lots of measures that can be put into place, but these need to be targeted and tailored to the needs of these groups. And it's not just one homogeneous group, but it's there are very different needs, and it's about how we address these needs and how and how we put efforts to really uh, reduce that and make sure that we actually uh, uh, that our societies are building on the on, on all the potential talent that talent that is out there. Mm. And it's, you see, in fact, it's it's actually quite interesting because uh, um, I I assume that you are measuring measuring this with the immigrants of the first generation. You're not talking about native-born uh, uh, children from of and of immigrants. You're not putting it in the same category, do you? No. We it's, have data for both. for both. We have data for native-born, data for immigrants first generation, and immigrants second generation. Mm -hmm. And and the the second generation continues to perform uh, perform a bit lower, or is it is it plus or the same? Typically, the second generation performs better than the first uh, generation, and in some cases, as, as well as I mentioned, with this uh, particular group of of immigrants, the Chinese students, they actually outperform the natives. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. Look before. We started recording this uh, this this program today. We we had a chat about uh, the shortage of teachers, and and you said that there's a one surprising result that that uh, uh, that you have identified in your analysis. Uh, you said that there is the ratio between the number of students and teachers is actually decreasing, um, and at the same time we have a lot of uh, accounts saying that we have a shortage of teachers. So the question is, if I understand it correctly, if the ratio between the number of students and teachers is decreasing, which means that there is more teachers per student, how is that? How is that uh, understood? And if so, do we really have a short shortage of teachers? And if so, why? I think that's indeed one of the the most puzzling uh, results of, of of PISA, uh, and I think it captures what we are seeing in the media or what we have seen in, in the media in, in the last year, which is basically uh, lots of calls of teacher shortages, of issues related to teacher well-being. There seems to be a general uh, uh, a general state of, of fatigue of uh, and of decreased morale and even some positions being very difficult to fill in some uh, countries. So that's what the news and what has been a hot topic in many countries from around the world, not just in, in, in one country, in many, many of them. What we see 
in the survey, which actually was filled in 2022, from February to November, depending on, on the country, is that school principals reported, they said that there were shortages in their, in, in their schools, that increasing the number of uh, teachers would help increase uh, the quality of, of education and the performance of uh, students. But actually, when we look at the data, what we see is that uh, student-teacher ratios and class sizes have decreased. So there seems to be more teachers in, in the system. And if there are more teachers in the system, why are we feeling or why principals and the general public is debating around the shortages of teachers? And the question there, I think it's much more complex than what PISA can, can tell us. And I think that merits a collective debate around is that the expectations that we, the demands that we have put on teachers have increased because of all the changes that we are seeing in society and the general call for the transformation and big improvement in the education systems. Are we asking more from our teachers? Is it uh, because actually uh, the way in which we are allocating them is not responding to the actual needs of the system? Is it because teachers are not performing as well as they used to do in, in the past? What explains this? It's certainly a variety of, of factors, but I think it generally points to some more critical and fundamental structural parts of, of, of our education systems, because as I mentioned, teachers are the most important resource uh, that we have in any education uh, system. And I think that overall, what we have seen in the last uh, decades is lots of changes in the uh, education system, lots of changes in what are the economic demands, the societal demands. We are just talking now about uh, generative AI. Uh, well, we are expecting teachers that are in the system that learn how to teach many years ago to now lots of a sudden, change the way they teach and embrace all of these new technologies. Uh, we are also asking teachers at the time of COVID when there was this big, big disconnection to completely change the role and reinvent their, their jobs. The demands that we have placed on teachers have uh, increased. Have we considerably changed the job responsibilities? Have we considerably changed how we understand the role of teacher of, of the teacher in this new, in these new uh, uh, education systems and these new education contexts, I think that's a question that we should all ask ourselves. Maybe, maybe it's not that much about the number of teachers we have in the system, but rather the skills mismatch that we need. Uh, maybe indeed it's about you know continuous development and training of teachers to prepare them to to teach things that are needed in the school in order to address the shortage. And of course, I think it's, it's uh, again, I haven't seen the data, so I'm kind of relying on what you're telling me, um, but uh, maybe it's, it's also country specific. I, I myself being involved on the policy level, I receive accounts of both sides here. Uh, and indeed in some countries they say, yeah, we do have a shortage of teachers, especially in STEAM and in mathematics and so on. Uh, but then other countries tell me, well, to be honest, we have we have many unemployed teachers, in fact, and we, we you know, there's many teachers that uh, yeah, but we, we kind of have a surplus of teachers that is that is bigger than the needs that we have. So so I think that indeed it, it, it really depends on the country. But I can tell you that uh, this interview has been giving me lots of surprises. Uh, uh, first of all, it kind of uh, broke my belief about the shortage of teachers and this this agenda that, well, there is a shortage of teachers and that we have to address it. And maybe maybe we just have to rethink the way we use their time. Uh, second, you said uh, spending money and and this analysis of money for value for money. Uh, that's uh, you know that is actually quite surprising. It's, there's always you know lots of stakeholders are, are asking that we should have more money in the system, and if we have more money in the system, the quality will be better. Uh, it turns out that not necessarily. And then of course your uh, your your claim about the time at school. Maybe we can even rethink the learning environments and put children in different environments. This, of course, would have to, we would be forced to uh, to rethink the entire work of the world of work, because if we have kids out of school, what do the parents do? How do they work? And, and so on. So, 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 of course, these are, I think, very interesting questions. Um, finally, I think I'm going to ask you the, the final question here is, 
It's about the measurement. Uh, uh, there's people that claim that this kind of analysis, uh, uh, let's say standardized testing, they don't really serve the purpose. Uh, because anyway, how can you really measure learning? I think it's it's a question. It's a question that uh, uh, we're trying to answer. I, I I don't think you will have a cutting, uh, let's say, cutting question, cut, cutting answer to it, a short answer to it. But uh, uh, is it really worthwhile to measure it this way uh, in in standardized testing? What kind of advantages does it have at all, if any, uh, to do that? It, I think indeed it's it, it's one of these fundamental questions. And what I would say is that if you don't measure, you don't know. And of course, there is no one right or wrong way of measuring. Each measurement approach has its own uh, advantages and, and disadvantages. I think if you want to have comparable data internationally, you need some sort of a standardization, right? Just because every system is different. And, and 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 I think that that's exactly, PISA has many pitfalls. And I think some of them, the ones that were able to be addressed have been addressed over time. As I was saying in the beginning, uh, we only measure mathematics, reading and, and, and science, but we've introduced global competence to try to measure the competence of the students and their attitudes. We introduce collaborative uh, collaborative learning. We introduce cre creative thinking. We are also doing a separate survey on social and emotional skills because they are the currency. They are the hard skills of the 21st century. So of course, no measurement is going to be perfect. But the point about standardized assessments is to really uh, provide and facilitate uh, an opportunity to for countries to compare each other to be able to set collective aspirations and to be able to have inspiring references. This doesn't mean that we should all now be copying uh, Singapore because Singapore has its own idiosyncrasy, has its own culture, but, but maybe there is something that we can learn from these countries that manage to do things differently and perform uh, better. Then maybe there is something that we can rethink of our systems that or that can help us affirm what we are doing well. And I think that's the point of comparing ourselves. It's to really try to see beyond ourselves. And of course, some people might say, well, this is a stressful and there is a lot of pressure. I don't want to be compared. Uh, but I think it's just by opening ourselves and trying to see these references that we can uh, improve and that we can also rally all the actors in our system towards this uh, improvement. And you know, one might think that, uh, well, our systems, and I think that's the biggest challenge that we haven't really uh, discussed so much uh, today, but are our school systems responding to the systems of the past, to the needs of the past? or our, our education systems preparing our students for the present and the future to come? That's, I think, the, the, the real question. And the question there that I think it's also very interesting is, is what we are measuring what was important in the past, or is what we are measuring what we feel that is important in, in, in the future? And that's a, a second, and I think a very important question that, that we should ask ourselves, and of course, PISA trying to go beyond what the students know and also measuring what they can do, tries to go on this direction of, of the future in trying to incorporate all these elements that are critical around uh, creativity, around resilience, tries to measure these skills that maybe in the past weren't so important, but in an age of automation, in an age where the world is so volatile and complex and changing, and we're all gonna have uh, very different jobs around our career are very, very important. And for example, one of the findings of PISA is that students that have greater creativity, that are more uh, resilient, they tend to perform better. Students with a growth mindset, students that think that their abilities are not fixed from birth, but, but with effort, they can go further and they can achieve more. These students tend to perform better. So of course, there is not that much that we can read into PISA, but it does provide us this common international reference to measure things that are critically important and to compare each other uh, in a way that we can draw this type of inferences. Mm -hmm. And this is, very valuable to, to policymakers. 
I think I, I must tell you that indeed, if I would think of, of one skill that the school should teach us, it's how to teach ourselves uh, or be able to, to teach ourselves. Because indeed, I mean, living in the world that we live in, uh, we will, one thing that we need to be able to do is to adapt and to continuously change. And, and maybe that's one thing. And the second thing is the love for learning. I think that's uh, uh, the school needs to be able to kind of inspire children and then adults to continuously learn. The moment you stop learning, you, you, you wake up and you start kind of pet petrifying yourself into a world that doesn't exist. And, and we can see that. Uh, there are studies about it as well where people who stopped learning at a certain point, they stopped reading, they, they, they kind of, you know, they got fixed into their jobs. They, they eventually become you know, petrified in their situation and, and often are not able to, to adapt to the new world that is, in, in fact, getting faster and faster. One thing that I believe PISA does very well indeed is giving us this comparative analysis and uh, and giving us this perspective or allowing us to really compare certain things and attract political attention. I think that education deserves political attention and PISA is one of those factors that that brings political attention to, to, to all of us. And for that, we thank you for, for this work. Uh, Anna, thanks a lot for, for being at Education Charter. Um, I think you also gave us a great number uh, of ideas for the next chats about about uh, about education, and, and we certainly will stay in touch with you. Uh, for to our viewers, if you like what you what you see, uh, give us a like, um, subscribe our channel, and if you indeed like this interview, share it on your on your social media so it can actually reach a wider group of people. And for now, Anna, again, thanks a lot for being with us and stay tuned. Thank you very much, Daniel, and see you very soon.